as you are seated and the ushers will be coming through, I, I do want to declare some things as we are honoring the Lord in his instruction and we are following a specific um, direction that he's given us to separate the two. You know, natural mind, you would think you can just give into the building fund at the same time that you are, are giving in the general tithe and offering. Uh, but the Lord directed us to make it separate for uh, His purpose, and so we're honoring that. And so I want to take First Chronicles. Um, actually, I'm going to do First Chronicles in just a moment. Let's do Exodus 24. Exodus 24. Years ago, I was studying a book called The Blood of the Christ by Andrew Murray. It's one of my favorites of his. And he was talking about, and, and I've taught from that, that teaching, had the progression of the blood being applied and being interactive in the relationship that God had with people ever since the fall and how that blood, when it was applied in Exodus chapter 24 to the people, that it, it invoked a response from God. So I want to look at that just a moment in verse 8 of chapter 24 of Exodus. Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you concerning all these words. The blood of the covenant. And it was sprinkled on the people. He had, in the previous verses, he had sprinkled the blood on the, the furniture. He'd sprinkled the blood on the book. He'd sprinkled it on the altar, on the basins, on the different things that represented their worship to God. But this was a step further than it had ever taken. And we see the interaction of the blood in, in the very beginning from the time that God shed the blood of those animals to prepare a covering for Adam and Eve to their sons coming and he's instructing them to bring that blood sacrifice of the firstling of the flock. And, and then through Noah, when he the very first thing he did coming off of the ark was to, uh, to make a sacrifice of blood. And, and throughout God's interaction since the fall, blood has been a part and the the blood on the people was a a a first in this this sense it was a, a first he sprinkled the blood on the people and and when you see God speaking again in chapter 25 the very first thing he talks about is wanting to have a closer contact with the people and the shedding of the blood always is the way for the closer contact. We have the blood of Jesus, which has made a new and a living way for us to enter in to the presence of God himself, to the throne of God himself. And because of that blood, we have that access. 25.1 of Exodus, the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering. Of every man that gives it willingly with his heart, you shall... I'll take my offering. So he says, speak to them that they would take an offering. Verses 3 through 7, he describes the very things for them to be bringing. And then in verse 8, he says, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Because of the blood, they now have a closer contact with God. They now have a, an, an ability to... to to enter, God says, I want to a sanctuary. I want closer contact. I want to be among them. Uh, make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. But notice this sanctuary was going to be made from willing offerings. This, this is willing offerings. This is willing hearts. And as we have in the past looked at those scriptures, as it says they brought it, it says, 
They brought it with a willing heart. It goes through Exodus chapter 35 and begins to talk about some of that. Uh, verse 5, for instance, is, Take ye from among you an offering unto the Lord. Whoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it. And that's what happened. Verse 21 of Exodus 35, They came, everyone whose heart stirred him, and everyone whose spirit made him willing. And they brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation and for all of his service, for all of the holy garments. And they came, both men and women, as many as were willing-hearted. Verse 24, everyone that did offer an offering of silver and brass brought the Lord's offering. Verse 25, and the, the women that were wise-hearted did spin with their hands and brought which they had spun. Verse 26, all the women whose heart stirred them up. So you see this willing offering throughout the description of how it was received. Now, I want to just take a moment in 1 Chronicles 29. And, and uh, God calling for the offering so that he could have a greater uh, influence on their life, a, a greater proximity in their life. Uh, we see this happening in 1 Chronicles when in actuality this was David who started it because he had discovered that the Ark of the Covenant had been taken captive by the, by the Philistines because of the uh, lack of uh, sincerity in the hearts of um, Eli's sons and, and the leadership of the nation at that time. And David called for the Ark to come back. And, and he brought the Ark back in, and he brought the Ark back in with worship. And he set up and had established a 24-hour worship around the presence of God, which was quite significant because there was... No separation. This was, think about, in the tabernacle in the wilderness, they had to come through through the priests, and the priests had to, only certain priests could go into the holy place, but only one priest could enter into the holy of holies where the Ark of the Covenant was. And here's David. He's got the Ark of the Covenant open with worship around it because of the honor, because of the way he was honoring God. He was honoring the presence of God. And so... He said, I want to build God a house. And God was so honored by David's desire that he said, you're not going to build it, but I'm going to give you all the design to build it, and I'll let you gather for the building of it. And this is what we see here as we're looking at uh, 1 Chronicles. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I want to look specifically at verse 1 of chapter 29, 1 Chronicles 29, 1. Furthermore, David the king said unto all the congregation, Solomon, my son, whom alone God has chosen, is yet young and tender, and the work is great. For the palace, this is what I wanted you to see, the palace is not for man, but for the Lord God. The palace is not for man, but for the Lord God. Hallelujah. When, when Kenneth Copeland first started flying in his ministry, he flew in used planes, usually very old planes. I, I remember hearing a statement that um, was kind of a joke at one time among the ministers who, the few ministers in the body of Christ who owned a plane, is that, that um, they didn't know their, they, they said, um, let's say for instance it was 1985 and they said uh you know this plane was made in 1980 and they they said wait a minute we didn't know there were not any planes made before 19 or since 1970 all of their planes were old i didn't tell the joke right y'all have to hear the joke from somebody else because i'm not good with jokes <laughs> The joke was that they didn't know there was any planes that weren't already 20 years old because all the ministers could afford were 20-year-old planes. And so they were surprised that they were still building planes, you know. It was a joke, but the, the, the thought was that none of them had planes that were newer. And when he moved his faith up and grew in faith, and it took a... a, a 
process of him building his faith, when he had his very first new plane, he said the Lord spoke to him and said, that's the only new plane I have in my ministry. Jesus said that. Jesus, Jesus finally got a new plane. Ooh, that's, that, that spoke to me because before that, the only planes Jesus had in his ministry were 20-year-old planes. He had all of his ministers flying around in old planes. And there, there goes back to the wealth of the wicked. And then you've got, you know, liquor store or liquor distribution companies and, and, and people who own pornographic magazines and, and worldly other things. And it's no problem for a golfer to have a plane or for a, a golf team of a university to fly in a plane that the university owns. But a preacher get a plane? No, how about Jesus get some planes? Well, this, this house that we're preparing for, this offering is for the Lord because it's His palace, which also identifies one of the most beautiful buildings. Our building is one of the most beautiful buildings in West Little Rock. Hallelujah. This palace is not for man, but for the Lord God. Hallelujah. Let me declare Zechariah chapter 2 and verse 4 and 5. Zechariah 2, 4, and 5, run, speak to Philip and Michelle Steele, saying, Faith builders, Little Rock, shall be inhabited as towns without walls for the multitude of people and supply therein. For I, saith the Lord, will be unto faith builders, Little Rock, a wall of fire round about, and I will be the glory in the midst of faith builders, Little Rock. I will ordain a place, 1 Chronicles 17, 9. I will ordain a place for my people, faith builders, and I will plant them, and they shall dwell in their place, and they shall be moved no more, neither shall the children of wickedness waste them anymore as at the beginning. Hallelujah. Exodus 36, 24, for I will take from among, I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. I will put my spirit in you, Ezekiel 37, 14, I will put my spirit in you, amen, and you shall live and shall place and I will place you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. And finally, Psalm 44, 3, For they got not their land, their land, in possession by their own sword, neither did their own arm save them, but they got their land by your right hand, Father, and by your arm and the light of your countenance, because you had a favor unto them. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you that you favor us. And that you have given us this instruction to prepare and you have made hearts willing to sow into your plan and your purpose for the future uh, for our own land. And we thank you for it and we release our faith and we give glory and honor and praise to your name. Hallelujah. If you would like to sow uh, and you need a different envelope, uh, there are ushers available. Just lift your hand if you need another envelope. Glory to God as we prepare to sow into the work of the Lord. Hallelujah. Gentlemen, if you'll come. Hallelujah. Did we have, are we distributing? Praise God. The Lord is good. I've got to get with the program and find out, are we having people come from their seats to give the offering? I, if I miss that, please forgive me. I'll do better. I'll do better. Praise God. Aren't we excited about what the Lord is doing? I am. I am so excited. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 5 Hallelujah. Glory, 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 glory. 1 Peter chapter 5. We are continuing 
in the focus that we have had um, concerning the shield of faith and using faith to resist. And again, there are many times that we teach, and rightly so, the importance of receiving by faith. Faith being the means of the kingdom, the equipping of the kingdom by which we receive the promises. It is God's grace, it is our faith, and by these we receive the promises are made sure unto us. And so that's right, and that's good for us to be proficient in the receiving application of faith, using our faith to receive from God, to lay hold of those promises, to bring into manifestation things that are already provided for us in the kingdom, using our faith on situations and circumstances that need to change, using our faith for healing, using our faith for uh, favor, uh, on the job favor in relationships, those are right. And yet there is the application of faith for the resisting and it is just as important that we become skilled in resisting that which needs to be resisted. And you would be right in resisting everything you are redeemed from. You, there is a resistance required for that. We're redeemed from sickness, and yet if sickness tries to come into your life, there needs to be a resisting on your part, a receiving of the covenant supply, yes, but also a resisting of that sickness. There is a resisting that needs to take place in lack. If lack tries to be uh, operative in your life, resistance is necessary. You've got to resist lack like you would resist sickness. And so learning how faith applies in that resisting and learning how to put it into action is what we're giving our emphasis to in these teachings. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8 and 9 says, Be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. That's why we're serious. That's why we're vigilant means to be on guard. Vigilant means to don't be caught with your head stuck in the sand. Don't be, don't be uh, uh, negligent to uh, what is going on around you. He says, be sober, be vigilant. Why? Because the adversary is always on the hunt looking for who he may devour. This is our response. If he comes sniffing around your house, this is our response. H whom resist steadfast in the faith that's how we deal with the adversary we resist him and we do it steadfastly and we do it with the tool the instrument the the armament the weapon of faith resist the enemy steadfastly let it be a consistent a consistent, well-founded resistance, and do it with faith. That's how you resist. Faith is the resisting. Faith is the force you use to resist the enemy. Faith in God, faith in the blood, faith in the name. All of those are applicable here. Faith in the promise, faith in the word, faith in your position in Christ, faith in, in all of these things can be utilized in the resisting of the adversary. So we are in this verse, we are informed that we have an adversary and now we know his objective. He's looking to devour, he's looking to destroy people. Uh, and we also see uh, that it is... Uh, a, a lot of people want to avoid that. A lot of people just don't want to even bring him in. I've had people say to me, I don't want to hear talk about the devil. Well, we're not going to give him any glory. 
And we're not going to give him any place, but we're going to identify his objective and we're going to identify his method of operation because without it, people are kept in the dark and they, they, that's how the Old Testament got some of the weird ideas those people got is because they had no, they had no revelation of the devil. You don't see the devil revealed. There was nothing they could have done about it on the Old Covenant anyway. Job didn't know the devil was out for him. You know, when God confronted the devil and said, what are you doing? What are you doing looking at Job? Have you been checking? What are you doing? Job is upright before me. He is a man of integrity before me. What are you doing sniffing around Job's house? Well, Job never knew the devil was involved in any of it. I mean, look back through the entire thing. He never knew the devil was a player in what took place in his life. Why? There wasn't anything he could have done about it under the old covenant. The reason we have the revealing in the New Testament about the enemy is because he's under our feet. We are perfectly equipped to bring him under subjection and to dominate any of his activity at all times all times. That's why it's important for us to pray for our nation. Because if there's no resistance from the righteous taking place in prayer about what's going on in the courtrooms and what's going on in the places where laws are being made, then how's God going to be able to affect his righteousness in those places? Hallelujah. The reason the revealing has taken place for us to be able to know that there is an adversary and how he works is because we are perfectly equipped to deal with him. We are perfectly equipped to every time win against anything he brings against us. Hallelujah. And so because Jesus has already defeated him and what he once held possession of, what, he, what the enemy uh, used in the lives of people, according to Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14, was the fear of death. The fear of death. But Jesus tasted death for every man so that through that he could destroy. Let's look at it. I want you to put your eyes on it. Hebrews 2, 14. He destroyed. I want you to see the, the tense used the verb tense used in this for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood he also himself jesus likewise took part of flesh and blood so that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death that is the devil do you see The verb is past tense, had, had. He no longer has the power of death. We've been delivered from, he has been rendered inoperative, the original verb of that destroy, to destroy or render inoperative the one who had the power of death, that is the devil. So if Jesus destroyed, rendered inoperative the devil, he's already destroyed. He's, and again, render inoperative. There's not one weapon he possesses that is, uh, that is capable of working in your life if you're walking in the light. If you're, if, you're, if you're being led and you're understanding and you've got light on the situation, you won't be deceived. The only thing he does now is mind blinding. That's what he has operative. He has been, the one who had the power of death has been destroyed or made inoperative. And Jesus, verse 15, delivered them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So that's what he used to keep people in bondage was the fear. Fear of death. We have eternal life now. We're not going to have eternal life just when we go to heaven. We possess eternal life now, which means we will never taste death. Jesus tasted it for us. Amen? In that victory, it, it is a, a, a life, a total life victory. This affects every area of your life. There's not one place that he holds a stronghold in your life if you don't give it to him. 
Amen? So when we identify that there is an adversary, this is his objective, this is how he operates, we can effectively resist him at every hand. It's not hard. It's not going to be something that you become obsessed with or it's going to consume your time. It's going to just become a part of your life. If he comes in, I'm going to resist him. You know, you can just see some of those, uh, uh, those old fighting movies or something and they, they would have all of these people coming against, you know, who was that, Bruce Lee or something? And, and they would just pile up on him and he would go whack, 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 whack. He'd just knock them all down with just, just like he's swatting flies off, you know? That's how we need to be. The enemy comes just swat that fly off. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. So uh, we are told to resist. That's how we deal with the enemy. We resist him. So that's different than battling. We don't battle him. We resist him. He's already been in battle with our master, our savior, our redeemer, Jesus. Jesus has already defeated him. And so I want to take uh, and look closer at the defeat and look at closer at Jesus' victory because when Jesus went to the cross and he died on the cross, who did he die for? I got my hand up. He died for me. When he became a curse so that, so that other people could be blessed, who did he become a curse for? He, went to, he became a curse for me. When he became sin... I mean, in a moment, made to be sin for me, right? When he took poverty, he became poor for me so that I could be rich. When he defeated the devil, he defeated the devil for me. That victory is mine. It is just as much my possession as my healing that he took stripes to pay for. It is just as my, much my possession as my prosperity that he took the curse of poverty on him for. It is just as much my, as a, a possession of mine as my righteousness that he became sin to effect for me. Hallelujah. Victory is mine. Victory is mine. Victory is mine. Victory today is mine. I told Satan, get thee behind. Victory today is mine. You should get up every day and remind yourself, victory is mine today. That victory Jesus effected, he didn't do it because he needed a victory over the enemy. He wasn't the one in bondage. We were, and he defeated. Now we are victorious through Jesus' victory. We are victorious, and so we enter into any uh, uh, resisting with that as our focus. I am victorious, and you're not moving me off my victory. Because Jesus established it, and he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. My victory is never going to change as long as I keep my hold on it. My victory is never going to turn into defeat. Hallelujah. The righteous may fall seven times, but you know what? Just keep getting back up. Just keep getting back up. Just keep getting back up. Why? Because God's just going to keep turning what the enemy meant for good to your benefit. If you'll stay in your place, maintaining your, your victory position in Christ. And this resisting then, this resisting is what we uh, are using our faith to do. We are doing it in faith. We're not resisting in our flesh. We're not resisting with our willpower. Not, we're not resisting with our mind, with our mental. We're not resisting with uh, who we are in the family as the mom, as the aunt, as the brother, as the sister, as the son, as the daughter. We're not resisting from any of those things. We're resisting with the tool that he used to get victory. What, is, what does uh, third John or, or 1 John chapter 5 say? This is the victory. This is the victory. This is the victory tool. This is how Jesus obtained victory, our faith. This is the victory, even our faith. So that's an identifier. 
The victory is in the faith, the using of the faith. And Jesus already, I, I, I appreciate how some other translations, uh, specifically one that would come to mind would be the Young's literal translation that identifies it as past tense. This is the victory that has overcome the world, putting it in past tense. This, this has already been used once. To overcome the world and anything in the world, to overcome. This has already been used by Jesus, this victory, this faith. And so he has delegated use of this faith to us. This will work for you to overcome whatever you need to overcome because Jesus already used it. It's like he took the tool out of his tool belt and just brought it and put it in your hand and said, here, you, you can use my tools. I, I know it works because I already uh, uh, worked victory with it. Amen. Hallelujah. James chapter 4, and let's look at verse 7. And I do want to look at this one from the Amplified. James 4, uh, 7. In the King James, it says, Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. This is the order. We're submitted to God first. And because we're submitted to God in that position where His authority has been delegated to us, if, if we're not submitted to God, we're not in the position where the authority is delegated. It's because Jesus is Lord that I have power to use His name. That I have the authority to use His name. It's because He's my Lord. If He's not my Lord, I, don't, I can't use His name. Did we see in the book of Acts some people trying to use the name, but they'd never made Him Lord? I mean, they, they came in quoting the, uh, I come to you in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. Trying to cast out this, these de demons out of this man who was possessed. They came in without being submitted. They had no position to use that authority because they weren't submitted to that authority. That's what the, the, the centurion in Matthew 8 was identifying. I am in authority, and I have people who are submitted to my authority, and I can tell them go. You know, he could have probably expounded because the way he started it was to say, I am, in, I am, I am a man under authority. He identified himself that way first. I am a man under authority. And so if he would have expounded, he might have said, when they tell me go, I go. When they tell me say this, I say this. When they tell me do this, I do that. You know, Jesus, he said, I only say what my father told me to say. I'm here to do the will of my father. I am not sent to do my, I am here to do his will. What was he saying? I'm under the authority of my father. And because I'm under the authority of my father, I am perfectly equipped to operate his delegated authority, the authority he has given me. And that's what the centurion was pointing out. And Jesus called it great faith. But he had an understanding of his position. He said, I am a man under authority, and I have those under my authority, and I understand how authority works. And if you'll speak the word, it's a command. I'm positioning myself and my house under your authority. If you'll speak the word over my house, my servant will be healed. Hallelujah. It was authority he was recognizing, but God called it faith. Jesus called it the greatest faith he'd encountered at that time. Hallelujah. And so this authority is where we are. It is our position in Christ that gives us the delegated authorization to cause Whatever is under the curse or whatever is of the enemy's activity to be put to naught. And if we don't resist, who will? If we don't say something, who will? If we don't take our place, God, who is just, is not going to come into a place. That's why God would not... God would not use someone in my congregation to correct me. 
he would not violate the authority he's given me. I, I, because I have positioned myself under leaders, under his people, his delegated authority, not just somebody I choose. Oh, I want that person to be my pastor. No, I have submitted where God told me to submit. If he wants to correct me, he uses. I didn't say he could. I'm telling you, he does. I, and, and I welcome it. I want to be corrected. I'm easily to easily corrected. Lord, correct me. I embrace instruction. I don't take it as a as an uh, something that is uh, uh, coming against me. I take it as something for my help. But because he has pay, placed me in a position, he's not going to violate the position of authority he's given me. Hallelujah. And in the same way, if, if you are the one in authority, God's not going to come and, and just kick you out of the way and say, you're not getting it done. Let me take over and get this taken care of. But do you see, this is why it's important to know when it's my responsibility to deal with something. Someone came to a minister one time. There, there was a, a person who had been... Um, hearing about uh, the word of faith and they did not have a sound foundation of the word of faith and so they took it to an extreme and they said um, well they came to him and said you've got to get your children are wandering around and these little children were out on the uh, the apartment grounds and and unsupervised and they came to them and said you know the pool is closed you need to keep supervision over your children so they don't go in the pool and their response was well we've given our angels charge over our children no evil shall befall them and we've given our angels charge over them you know it wasn't those angels fault to supervise the children the angels are there to help to avoid accidents to take care of things unseen but if it's seen whose responsibility is that do you see how that can become if, if people say well I'm just believing God I'm just believing God well God you might be believing God and he wants you to use your authority you might be saying I'm believing God then God says I'm going to put my words in your mouth I'm going to tell you how to deal with this I so appreciate a, a, a experience that Pastor Nancy was dealing with. Uh, and, and in this dealing with it, she finally came to the Lord and she said, Lord, I'm willing to use my faith. I am willing to apply my faith. And if it's wrong for me to talk to you about this, please forgive me. But she was bringing this thing up. She had been taking a stand in faith. She'd been declaring in that situation. But then she comes to the Lord and she said, if it's wrong for me to talk to you about this forgive me but I just don't feel like or I don't have a, a spiritual sensing that I'm making any progress in this please tell me what my part is and the Lord responded and said it's not wrong for you to bring it to me what I'm going to do how I'm going to help you is I'm going to put you in the spirit and, and you know you can we walk in the spirit we, we are filled with the Spirit of God. We, we, we walk by His guidance. He indwells us. But there are times in your praying, if you haven't experienced yet, stay there just a little bit longer in prayer. There are times that you enter over into a place, you know I'm in a position of authority, and you start saying things, or you start declaring things, or you start dealing with that situation from that place, and you know it's different. Can I get a witness in the house? Y'all know what I'm talking about? And that's what the Lord said. I'll put you in the spirit so that you can speak what you need to speak. And that's what happened. She said when she went to the next prayer meeting, she was there. She had, was conducting the prayer meeting and, and, uh, and moved over into the place telling everybody to pray. She said, I went down and got to my seat to pray. And God, I was just in the spirit in that moment. And I began dealing with that situation from that place in the spirit. But to notice, God didn't just do it outside for her on his own. He still needed her authority to deal with it. He still needed her voice, activated faith, to, to be uh, authorizing. Why? Because God has given us dominion. 
He's given us to, Jesus did not do any miracles, healing, signs and wonders after he resurrected and before the ascension. Why? Because he was in a different position of authority. He instead delegated to his disciples and said, you go in my name. We are now the body of Christ. If any righteousness is going to be enforced, you and I are going to be the enforcers. Come on, Barney, get your bullet out of the pocket, put it in the gun. Right? Keep the bullets loaded in the gun. Why? Because we're authorized. We've got to, we are the ones who are, God's not going to usurp our authority and come in and he has, it would be wrong for him to do it. And he's just, he's not going to. And so we've got to learn the resisting that faith provides. Resisting. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. James 4, 7. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will, he will, will. I mean, you just need to circle it, mark it real big. Oh, yes, he will. He will flee. You need to be bold about that. You need to be bold about that. I've heard examples of people who... Uh, they came, for instance, to Brother Copeland and, and said, uh, we've got this, this demon that needs to be cast out. Come on, we're going to spend the night in the room casting this demon out. And he said, I'm not spending the night in the room casting the demon out. <laughs> we're going to take authority. And, there, and, and about that time in his ministry, somebody brought a young man who had been uh, having uh, these seizures and, and, and different uh, manifestations and when they brought the the person up for him to pray he prayed for that person and the person fell out and started having one of the manifestations and and he said I walked away and I had to keep my mind on the fact that the enemy will leave and he said the next day I'm sitting there having to still fight my mind and the next day that young that person got free but he had to hold on to his faith that what he spoke when he exercised authority, he didn't need to go back and pray it again. He didn't. Why? There's a difference in that. There are going to be things that you may be applying your faith to more than one time. That's not the prayer of faith. It's going to be things such as you're going to use faith in the prayer, but the prayer of faith itself is a prayer that lays hold of something and maintains that hold. But there are going to be times that you're praying for people and you're going to, God's going to have you pray the same scripture over that person multiple times. Why? Because you're, it's like medicine being applied to that, to, to that wound. You're, you're applying the word to that situation, applying the word. Those are, are different types of prayer. And, and in dealing with the adversary, there needs to be a laying hold of with our faith on the authority. No, you're not going to operate here. Hallelujah. And so he had to make sure that he kept his position of faith and didn't regress and try to go back and we'll bring him back and let me pray for him again. Hallelujah. Resist and he will flee. He will flee. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. The Amplified says, so be subject to God. Resist the devil. Stand firm against him. Stand firm against him. Be subject to God. Stand firm against him. Hallelujah. That's the resisting. I take my place in Christ. I take my place in health. I take my place in, in whatever the situation may be. You find your place in Christ. You hold it up and you say, no, I'm resisting that. I'm standing firm against that. I'm not allowing that to go on here. Hallelujah. Go back to 1 Peter 5 and let's look at verse 9. And I want to look at verse 9 from the Amplified. Again, he said in the King James, Whom resist steadfast in the faith, the Amplified says, Withstand him. Be firm in faith against his onset, rooted, established, strong, immovable, and determined. Withstand him. 
1 Peter 5, 9, Amplified, withstand him, be firm in the faith against his onset. So that means that we need to be prepared. That's why he said, be sober, be vigilant. Just stay on guard. You know, I heard someone talking about the armor of God and say, just put the armor of God on every day. How about we just sleep in the armor of God? How about just leave it on all the time? I don't have to get up and, and apply and put on my, my breastplate of righteousness. and, and my, my, No, I can just live armed. Hallelujah. Withstand him. Be firm in faith against his onset. Rooted, established, strong, immovable, and determined. Glory to God. Amen. Glory to God. That confidence is going to come from faith. That stand, that kind of a stand, that description can only be done by the supernatural force of faith that the Word will provide you. You can't do this with your, just your personality alone. You cannot do this with determination alone. It needs to be a holy determination that's coming out of your heart. That no, I, I will not allow that to take place in my life. No, no, I shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. No, no, I am the head and not the tail, above and not beneath, never going over, always go, uh, never going under, always going over. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And that comes from knowing. That comes from having that confidence that the Word provides to be able to come out of your mouth to resist with. And so we see that this resistance is a shield. Ephesians talks about the armor of God that I was just referring to. And in the description, it also talks about our absolute victory. At, from the onset, from the onset, we're in victory. In chapter 6, verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. And in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So... You are able to stand against any and all of his wiles. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And yes, they could have condensed those grammatically, I'm sure a proofreader would have come and said, let's just condense these and put some commas in there. And let's just say, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual, and spiritual wickedness in high places. We would have condensed that if we were proofreading that verse right there, wouldn't we? Right? But the intention of the Holy Spirit is for us to see what this word against is supposed to be producing. And it is an, in, uh, in the original language, it is a word that describes face-to-face -face contact, face-to-face -face, uh, resistance, face-to-face -face combat. And no, we're not fighting the devil from a position of trying to gain victory, but if he comes, I'm going to get in his face. And I'm going to stand against him. So that's what this word, bulldog faith, that's what this word against means, in the face. It means, and it means a, a, a force, a face-to-face, -face, close contact. And so if the enemy comes, it is not, this verse is not supposed to cause anybody to feel intimidated. Oh, we wrestle against. Oh no, we what? We got to wrestle against principalities. <gasps> principalities, oh the principalities. Powers. The rulers of darkness. Oh, no. Flies. Swat the flies. Swat the flies. I'm standing. Where am I? Where am I? Let's 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 find where we are. Hold on. Hold on. Remember where we are? 
Let, let's look back at Ephesians chapter 1. I want to show you where you are just so that you know in, con, in comparison to these. 121 of Ephesians. Far above all principalities, power, might, dominion, every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which this is you. Why? Because we're in Christ. This, this is the victory he wrought for us when God raised Jesus from the dead and set him in this place. He set him in this place of a position. This is the position you are in. You are far above. So that's not talking about geographically. It's talking about in rank. It's talking about your dominion. You're far above. There's not one principality that you are submitted under. I'm talking about demonic principalities. There's not one demonic principality that you're not over. You have a, a jurisdiction that supersedes them all. You have a jurisdiction, qualification, authorization to enforce the will of God over any demonic, no matter what rank it holds, any and all, you're in the position over. If the one in authority isn't doing something, I, I was getting my hair cut one day, and I had, uh, actually, I was waiting at this point, and one of my children, this was when my children were younger, and one of my children was back getting their hair cut, and so I'm sitting there in, in the waiting room, and there's this little child uh, with its brother, and uh, the parent was getting their hair cut and left their kids out here unsupervised. I'm on these unsupervised kids today. They left these kids out there unsupervised, and this one was a terror. I mean, just causing all kinds of trouble, running around, pushing things over, and pulling stuff out, knocking things over. And the, the other brother that was supposed to be watching him was not getting the job done. They were just arguing with him, stop, 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 stop. And he would just go from one thing to the next, and finally I had all I could take. I just looked up at him and I said, no, you need to sit down. And amazing how quick that little boy just found his self-control. <laughs> he found self-control because somebody who could exercise. I didn't have a whole lot of authority in his life, but he didn't know that. All he knew was I was looking at him saying, and I kept my, if he started to get out of that seat, I, gl I glared at him. <laughs> no, you don't. Hallelujah. If the one in authority in the situation is unaware of their authority, unaware of their ability to handle that situation, the enemy is going to take full advantage of that and just run wild. He is going to go as far as he can go. He's going to test the waters. He's seeking whom he may. How does he go around seeking? He's going around testing the boundaries. You know, that's what he did to Job. He tested until he found an area that Job would get over into fear about. And when Job got over into fear, the, the door was open and God said, what he has is already in your hands. Why? Because Job put it there. Mm, at lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge. And it, it wasn't a knowledge of the enemy that he needed. It was a knowledge of his position with God. Because he, 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 he did not at that time have the ability to resist the devil, but he, uh, through fear, tore down the protection that God had provided as a resistance. Hallelujah. It, wrong expectations will tear down the health that God has already stored up for you in your last days. A, a wrong expectation of, well, I've got to allow this to happen because it's just part of growing old. No. Moses' eyes were not dimmed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That wrong expectation, though, is like a lowering of the force field. A wrong expectation and joking about it. Oh, well, you know, they say the first thing to go is the mind. No, blessed is the memory of the just. 
Bless, and the enemy will use those things, teasing, use those things just to try to get them in your mouth. Just to try to get you to agree with it. Because if you agree with it, you authorize it. So it's not funny. Don't make it a joke. If someone says to you, ha ha, you know, you say, oh, I'm trying to remember that. Well, you know, you're getting that age. Your mind, no, no. Blessed is the memory of the just. Hallelujah. We resist, that's resistance. That is part of the resisting. So when we see here, we are far above all principality, power, might, and dominion. This is our rank. So learn to operate in the position you've been placed in. Learn to exercise authority from this position. Go back with me to chapter 6. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we do wrestle or resist. That wrestling is a resisting face-to-face -face against principalities, powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. Hallelujah. We can do it in prayer, but you don't have to be in prayer to do it. You're not limited to being in prayer when you take these positions of resisting. Whenever the, the resistance is necessary, where, wherever you are geographically when the resistance is necessary, just step into your place. Just, just, you're in your place in Christ. Never stepped out of it, right? You just, just take your place in Christ uh, to that situation and resist it. So we are able to stand against. Verse 13, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to, to withstand. And there's that word that we saw from the amplified version of resist. Resist, withstand. So withstand, you are able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, having done all to stand, stand. Stand. That word stand means to make firm, to be fixed, to establish, to uphold or sustain the authority or force of anything. To uphold or sustain the authority. That's the stand. It's, a, it's a, a watch. It's an authority. I'm the one on guard here. I'm the one equipped here. I'm the one authorized here. See my badge? See my badge? I've got my badge. I'm authorized. I'm authorized in the name of Jesus. I'm authorized. Stand. That's the stand. It's a stand of authority. And it's upholding what has already been established by Christ, which is victory. So if anything comes trying to move your life or a situation in your life in another direction, you're authorized to maintain the will of God in that situation, to enforce and maintain the flow of God's will in that situation. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking. Whose responsibility is it to take? Taking the shield of faith. Now we see faith in this resisting described as, as what it is accomplishing it's a shield. It shields. It stops the darts of the enemy. The weapons, the, the missiles that have been launched against you are stopped when they encounter the shield of faith. They hit your faith and they stop. The attack stops when it, when it hits your faith. I don't see any faith in Eve's words when she's talking with the enemy. There was nothing to stop him. There was nothing that made him uncomfortable. When she said, God told us not to even eat, not to even touch the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The enemy knew what God said, and he knew that's not what God said. 
So because she was not established in the truth, she was not established on the word, she didn't have that firmly fixed in her heart, it got twisted in her mind. And then the enemy knew to press further. Every, every, every interaction led him in his next response. It was a battle from his side. She thought it was a conversation. But she never resisted. And, and that's why, listen... The devil never, the enemy never wants you to think that it's him. He never wants glory for what he's doing. He never wants you to recognize and him say, yeah, that's right, it was me. No, he, he wants you to think those thoughts are your thoughts. He wants you to think, eh, I was thinking the other day. You weren't, no, was, was that just you thinking? Or did the enemy introduce a thought? He came to Eve. Now listen, he is no creator. The devil's not a creator. He cannot create anything. The only thing he can do is take something that's already established and twist it. So when, when he came and, and began tempting Eve with these thoughts, that's the same way he came to Jesus. He came the same way because he didn't have any new tricks. He came the same way he attacked Jesus, the same way he attacked Adam and Eve, with words that contain thoughts. Words are just thought containers, just, just, just thought containers, just the cans you put the thoughts in. And he came with those words, and, and the more that they accepted those words, what are they really accepting? His thoughts. You know, God was talking about his thoughts in Isaiah 55, and he says, my, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. My ways are higher than your ways. And then he switches right over and starts talking about his words. He said, so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. Wait, wait, wait. I thought we were talking about ways and thoughts. Words contain the ways and thoughts of God. That's how he gets them transmitted to us. He put them in word capsules. Do you remember the contact commercial years ago? They had this cold medicine called contact. And they there was this one commercial that they would show them opening the, it was like a close-up, and they could see all these little, these little, um, those little specks, those little um, capsule, the inside the capsule was all the medicine, and it was like in, in spec form. It was like little dots what was the word granules thank you that's a good one granules inside this and they would open up and this commercial it just it's a picture in my mind this com it shows all of those granules falling out onto this white countertop and they were talking about all the medicine that helps you in that that well god's capsules are full of his medicine are full of his thoughts his ways his medicine for your marriage his medicine for your physical body, his medicine for your finances. They're all capsulized. They're all contained. All those, those words are containers, capsules, then, and you can get them into your system by accepting the word. Well, the enemy, not being a creator and having to be a copycat, he, he, he got some empty capsules and he stuffed his ways and his thoughts inside those words, and he came and the enemy said, can we look at how he, he attacked Jesus in what we refer to as the, the temptation in the wilderness? Let's look together at Matthew 4. Matthew 4. How did he attack Jesus? It says in verse 3, When the tempter came to him, he said. He said. That's how, that's how he attacked Jesus. He didn't jump on him. Didn't put a gun to his head, a knife to his throat. I mean, when he came to Eve in the garden, he came, he came talking. Did God say? Yeah, I can just see that little smirk on his face. He's, he's, it appears to be just, I need to know. I, I'm, I'm trying to just open. What he really wants is, I need to know what you know. I need to know where you stand. 
I need to know if you know you can resist me or not. I, I need to know if you know you have authority over me. I, I need to know if you're gonna if you're gonna do anything about what I say, because if not, I'm gonna take another step. I'm gonna get a little bit more ground and I'm gonna come in a little closer. Oh, and you don't you still don't know? <laughs> I'm gonna keep on walking in then. And I'm gonna go ahead and help myself to this and I'm gonna help myself to this. Oh, you still don't know you have authority over me? Well, how about I take the recliner and you go get me some tea and bring me some cornbread? <laughs> and then he starts bossing, you know. Yeah. Why? Because if they don't know. That was the whole purpose of the conversation, to find out how far he could go before she resisted him. And there was no resistance. There was nothing that, that withstood him. There was nothing that, that lifted up a, a resistance against him. But in, in this attack, he said, he used words to attack. And he, again, is no creator. He's still using the same tactic. We looked at some of those tactics last week, and we looked specifically at that word wiles. We found out that that word wiles means uh, to make a road. We, are not, we can uh, withstand all the wiles of the devil, the wiles, to make a road. It's the word that, it's uh, metahodas, and it's the same word that we use for the word odometer, odometer, hodas. And it, it talks about he's trying to pave a road into our thinking. Trying to, trying to get his way of thinking. Just if you accept one, he'll pave it a little bit further. And if you accept it, and, and, and until he gets that person thinking wrong. And that's what he did to Eve. Because she didn't used to think. It says, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and a tree to be desired to make one wise and a tree that was pleasant to the sight. What made her think that? She didn't think that way the day before. She didn't think that way the week before. What made her suddenly come to the conclusion, this tree is a tree I desire to make me wise. This tree is now pleasant to my sight. This tree it is pleasant for food for me. What made her think that way? Now listen, how you think is going to affect how you behave. She never reached for the fruit of that tree before. Why? Because she used to think that she wasn't supposed to eat the fruit of that tree. But now she is totally reversed in her thinking so that now it's pleasant for food. What got that reversal in thinking? She accepted the wrong containers with wrong thoughts in them. No, not resisting the thoughts. And when the tempter came to Jesus, he said, and he used words, to put thoughts, hoping that Jesus would do the same thing that Eve had done and just, just unlock, un, 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 open up the can, pop open that container, and eat out of the, what was in the can. Take into your spirit. That's what he wants. He wants those words to get into your heart. Jesus, let me go even farther back. Proverbs. Chapter 4, verse 20, attend to my, my thought containers. Attend to my thought containers. Give your attention, your thought life to my thought containers, my words. How do you do that? Do not let them depart from before your eyes. Keep them in your ears. Why, I, you've got to get my words in the eye and in the ear, and then what's going to happen? In the, in the heart. Keep them in the heart. Because they are life to all who discover and maintain possession. Find is a word in the Hebrew that means to find and continue to hold in possession. Not to find it and then just walk away and this is what I once knew. Because Hebrews chapter 2 tells us, Therefore, we should give more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, so that we don't let them slip. 
talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ, that what God is speaking in the, in the, in the, before he spoke to us through the prophets, but now in these last days he speaks to us by his son. That's why we should give the more earnest heed to the things which we hear and not let them slip, the things which we have heard, have heard. Ha things that have heard could slip if you're not giving heed to them. And so he says, give attention to my word. Attend to my thought containers. Attend to them by putting them in your eyes and in your ears continually. Not just once, not just once a day, but just keep that throughout your life continually so that it's deposited in the heart because in the heart is where the thoughts and the ways of God are able to bring forth his life. Their life to all of those who find them and health to all their flesh. Find and maintain in possession. When the tempter came to Jesus, he said, so he put his thoughts in these containers and he launched them in towards Jesus, but Jesus lifted up a shield. He raised a, a resistance against the attack, the temptation, the words that the enemy had used to put his thoughts and his ways in and trying to launch them at Jesus. Jesus put the shield up against the, the fiery dart, the flaming missile, and Jesus answered and said. So he didn't answer and think. He didn't answer meditating, and he didn't answer in tongues. Pastor's first trip over to Africa, the trip he had taken a mission trip over to Ghana to some of the, the locations that we have there, and he took some people with him. And, and of this group of people, he discovered an error in their foundation of thinking because they encountered some people who needed to be set free, and they started trying to set these people free and exercise authority over the devil by speaking in tongues. And he finally had to stop them and say, stop. We don't, we don't deal with the devil in tongues. That is not the prescribed method for us. We take authority in the name of Jesus. And they were trying to pray in tongues against the enemy. The Bible says when a man prays in tongues, he speaks to God. He speaks to God. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. When a man prays in other tongues, when a man speaks in other tongues, he speaketh unto God. Howbeit in the, in the natural, he speaks mysteries. Hallelujah. So, so Jesus wasn't resisting with praying in tongues. He wasn't resisting with thinking. He wasn't resisting with singing. He was resisting with saying. Now, you can say it in a song if you need to say it in a song, but make sure you got something in the song you're saying. It is written. This is our example, and this works today. If you have received a wrong thought from the enemy, an attack against your mind, an attack against your life, if you want to resist the devil, you're going to have to open up your mouth and you're going to have to say what God has said. It is written. Hallelujah. Verse 5. Then the devil took him up into the holy city and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, so, Je so Jesus is now in a situation, the enemy is attacking him and has put him in a situation and now he presents to him something that appears to be the word. He said to him, if you be the son of God, cast yourself down. For it is written. Remember, he's trying to find out where you stand. He's trying to find out what you know. He's trying to find out if you'll resist. It is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning you. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest at any time you dash your foot against a stone. 
That's like the woman who said he's given his angels charge over my child to keep them from... No, he's given you responsibility to make sure your children aren't wandering around in the pool unsupervised after when pool's closed. Hallelujah. Trying to put him in a position and force him and then using this as well, the scripture... And Jesus said unto him, it is written. He just pulled the sword of the Spirit. Can you just hear it? Right out of the sheath, pull that sword of the Spirit. It is written. You shall not tempt the Lord your God. He's trying to take Scripture out of context and use it against him. Again, the devil took him up into an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and said unto him, all these things, he said unto him, he said, all these things will I give you if you'll fall down and worship. So three times we've seen the enemy using an attack against Jesus by saying unto him. The attack's not in the position that he is on top of the pinnacle. The attack's not in the position of what he's seeing. The attack is in the words. The attack is in the thoughts and the ways of the enemy that are contained in the words of the enemy. And Jesus resisted everything the enemy brought against him with the word of God. From Deuteronomy. I mean, Jesus just pulled from Deuteronomy. Every one of his responses comes from the book of Deuteronomy. And, and we've got... Colossians and Philippians and the book of James and first and second Peter and first and second Chron first and second Corinthians we've got all kinds of ammunition yeah. hallelujah but the key is it's got to be in your mouth we've got to learn how to answer the adversary we've got to learn how to speak the word hallelujah to resist the enemy. Glory to God. Father, I'm so grateful for the equipping of your word, for the provision that you've placed in the kingdom for us to operate in the authority you've given us. I ask that you would Help us apply this authority in our lives in a greater measure. Father, that you would help us enter in and become proficient in enforcing your will in our lives. Father, any area that we have been wrongly waiting for you to do something we should do, I ask you to bring it to our attention. Put your finger right on it. And Lord, we'll bring our obedience to that and we'll start coming up with resistance against that place. If you'll show us, Father, we'll grow in this area. And you've shown us from your word and we're going to take it, Lord, and we're going to apply it to our lives and, and we're going to be sober and be vigilant and we're going to resist the adversary at every onset. And we're going to resist in faith because we are already more than conquerors. We already see that we have overcome him by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. We thank you for that. While your eyes are closed and your head is bowed, if you're in this place and you've never accepted Jesus as Lord, this is the day of salvation for you. Don't miss the moment that God has made available for you to be here in this place where his Spirit is reaching out and offering to you an, an exit from the struggle and an entrance into his blessing. If you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, the Bible says that believing in the heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead and declaring out of your mouth that Jesus is Lord over your life is, is a supernatural transformation for you. Calling on the name of the Lord. There is no salvation outside of Jesus. 
And there is no help available from God that doesn't begin with Jesus being the Lord of your life. He's so full of mercy. He's so full of compassion. And Jesus is the entrance to the mercy and the entrance to the compassion. He is the way. He is the door. He is the truth. He is the life. If you're here today and you would like to say, I want to receive Jesus Christ as my Lord, would you lift your hand right where you are? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to pray for the, the people who are watching us who are raising their hands right now. I believe that, that God is reaching through this mode of, of communication to minister life to your situation today. If that's you, I want you to pray with me right now. Open your heart and just say it out of your heart. I believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for my sin. I believe that you raised Jesus from the dead. And this very moment, I received Jesus Christ to be my Lord and to be my Savior. Wash me in your blood. Cleanse me from all sin. And show me how to walk in the path that you have for me. Hallelujah. If you've prayed that prayer, you're a new creature in Christ. And you need to have the Word of God to help you identify everything that belongs to you. And you need to receive uh, the covering of a pastor. So wherever you are watching from, God's going to lead you to a pastor. Put yourself in the local church so you can grow. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm so grateful for the ways that God has provided in the kingdom for his, his healing power to be distributed. He said that the prayer of faith will heal the sick. He said that you can lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. He has placed in the body of Christ gifts of healing. Gifts of healings. It's, tr it's plural in one of the verses, gifts of healings. Hallelujah. In the body of Christ, he's placed anointings that will provide healing in people's lives. And I know that uh, here today, if you are having any area of your body that you are believing for healing in, we have available faith and anointing and gifts available to help you today if you are here today and you desire to receive healing in your body would you just come from wherever you are and i'm going to pray with you and i believe the anointing of the lord that's upon my life is going to minister to you of his healing power he's the healer and he's here today and his desire is to make you whole hallelujah praise god would you just lift your hands and begin to worship him wherever you are? Hallelujah. Strength for the body. He wants us whole. He wants us whole. He wants us whole. He wants us strong. He wants our body. There are things that happen in the body sometimes that's not the attack of the enemy and it's not necessarily the curse. Sometimes things get worn out. God can restore those. God can restore organs that are, are, are damaged because of, of things that we've eaten or things that we've uh, in, taken into our body. He can restore things that are, have become worn out. He can restore knees. He can restore the ligament in your knees. He can restore the ligament in your knees. Hallelujah. He can restore hip joints. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. He can regulate blood count. He can make, he can make the, the blood be accurate so that it doesn't have sugar that's too high or, or uh, things that are too low. He can regulate that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for your healing power. Thank you, Lord, for your healing abilities that you've placed in the body. And Father, 
Hishtumbala kese tumbura yase tuba koshakala kese teishin tamahaha. Hala esein de ishtamanoma laha seyena hani. Ande andi ande andi and andi amoni aha santa haha. Hala yishishi and shanomo ho 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 kisika haha. Eli ishi ande ambali ani amahaha. Ese temburi ishi tene aha kiese te aha. Ili si, ili si, ili si, ti embidi ishti and damaha. And there are anointings that will increase upon those in the body. There are anointings that will increase upon those who are skilled and desiring to become more skilled. In the working of the kingdom, in the working of my word, in the application of my will. And those anointings are through the body for the purpose of ministering and bringing my will to pass in the lives of the people that you touch and the te- people that you, you are in contact with. anointings and equippings and purposes and plans that I desire to move you into. They are prepared and they are available and they are for this last day. And they are coming to those who are interested. And there's co- they are coming to those who make their life available to my voice make their days, set the atmosphere in their home to hear from me. Because I will lead you and I will guide you and I will teach you how to walk in my anointings. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. I'm interested, Father. I'm interested. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm interested. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 My my right arm has just, it, it just became very heavy. So as I lay my hands upon you, receive of this anointing. In the name of Jesus.
financial adversity. The anointing is here to deal with that financial adversity. Come from where you are. Hallelujah. You are the blessed. And under the anointing, I'm going to pronounce that blessing as an enforcement. In the same way that we resist sickness with the anointing, there's a resistance for that lack under the anointing. Financial adversity. Financial adversity. It could be your wrong decisions in spending. God will help you if you've caught that and you've changed it and now you're dealing with the debt of it. There's, a, 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 there's an anointing. Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me, first thing, to preach the gospel to the poor. Lack is dealt with through the anointing and the Word. The anointing and the Word. Mala eso tamahai. Mele ashtabali adaboko.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. Great and mighty are you, Lord. divine utterance that came forth from our pastor, Pastor Seal, concerning the last four months of this year. He said, first of all, that August was an epicenter. And I've already been experiencing things loosening in my life and light and understanding coming. But here in this last four months, he said this last four months was loaded. But there's something that's specific that's in my heart right now. And he said in this last four months, things that have seemed unchangeable, and I hope I'm saying that right, Lord. Things that have appeared to be unchangeable are going to change. It's as if things that have been so stalwartly against you so refusing to be budged in your life these are things that because of of this this equipping they're going to be so easily moved and so easily turned So that means you've got to change the way you think about those things. Don't look at them as that's been the hardest thing I've ever had to deal with. Or that thing just won't move. It will move. And we're entering into this this time. You, You need to have an expectation. That's gone. That is gone. Hallelujah. And I just had a specific one for me personally come up, and I'm going to encourage you when you've got to identify it. God told us that would happen. We just don't need to to twiddle our thumbs and wait. No, he wants to identify to you that thing that you think isn't going to be changed. He wants to identify it so that you can say, I'm expecting that to change. I'm expecting that to change. Things that they say are incurable, you can expect them to change. Things that they say are irreversible, 
with God can reverse it. God didn't call it irreversible. With God, nothing shall be impossible. With God, all things are possible. All things are possible. All things are reversible. All things are changeable. With God, all of those things are changeable. Hallelujah. 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 <laughs> Hey ya, and ain'ty no ma has ain't day and dollar ya ha 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 di. Nay shant and ten a more co calavedi antana ma ha ha. Nay yalla di o te a shant and a yumbo coco tamba ha. And you will be known as a person of joy. And you will be known for the countenance of joy that is upon your face and you will be known for your laugh. They'll hear your laugh coming down the hallways of your job. They'll hear your laugh as you're coming in the house. They will hear the joy because I have it, I have turned and I have turned and I have turned and I have turned your morning into to uh, into rejoicing and I have turned. I have turned the adversity and so now is the time. Now is the time to enter into the joy and to prepare yourself for a greater flow of joy. You will be known as the people of joy. You will be known for the rejoicing in your house. You will be known for the rejoicing of your face. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He fills our mouth with laughter. He fills our mouth with laughter. He fills our mouth with laughter. We were like them that dream. He fills our mouth with laughter. <laughs> <laughs> he fills our mouths with laughter. Woo! Hallelujah. There's a flow for you. Enter into that joy flow right now. Just open your mouth and laugh. That's how you drink. That's how you drink in the house of God. <laughs> you got to have your mouth open to drink. <laughs> made me glad he has made me glad just say it with a smile he has made me glad tell three people go get up out of your seat go find somebody don't just reach around get up move around tell somebody he's made me glad he's made me glad he's made me glad he's made me glad he has made me glad
All right, as we're dismissing, can we say this together? The vision of this house is to build people's faith and frame their world by the word of God. You and I will always be world changers. Amen.